and it almost scared me. I heard in a very quiet voice, Sonia. Happy New Year. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Good, 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 good and well. Okay. Well, great. Y'all, I'm so excited to be here in 2022. This is the first time I've been in the building in 2022. So I'm, I'm so excited to be back in the house of the Lord. Now listen. <laughs> I would have been here Friday, but it was my 23rd anniversary. So we, have, we already had plans. So. <laughs> That's true. Friday was New Year's Eve, but that was my anniversary. So anyway. So thank you, thank you. If you all would stand, the worship team would come on. We're going to praise the Lord. Um, I was listening to something coming to church this morning, and uh, it really stuck out to me that we are creatures of habit. And how do we become creatures of habit? By doing them consistently. So I always turn my radio on, and I listen to praise and worship music, and um, that puts me in the mindset to where I need to be every morning. And sometimes I think, Lord, what else can I do? What else can I do? And he says, you're doing exactly what I want you to do. You're, you're, you're learning. You're getting into worship, and the Word is worship. So um, as we get ready to start praise and worship, we're going to go into prayer and just thank him for all his many blessings. Lord, thank you for another new year. Thank you for joy in the house, dear Lord. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Dear Lord, thank you for provision where it's needed in every area. And dear Lord, thank you for your love and your mercy that covers us in a multitude of blessings. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Bless our worship. Let it be unto you and only you, Lord Jesus, in all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Before we start with the worship this morning, I just want to make a quick announcement. We've had some trouble. By the way, those watching by Facebook, welcome. We've had some trouble over the last two or three weeks with the signal not being good, and we're trying to figure out what that is. But one thing that you can do to help um, as we start out service today, if you would, number one, mute your phones so they don't ring or an alarm's going off in the middle of service. But if you would, number two, if you have, if you're connected to the church Wi-Fi, if you would disconnect to that during service, that may help with the feed, with the live feed. We want everyone at home to be able to see the service well. So um, if you would do that, that would be great. So, uh, amen. How many, ready to, how many are ready to worship the Lord? Amen. There's no one. 
Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus.
what he's done in your life. for your presence here today. I thank you for this wonderful beginning to a new year. And I just pray that you will continue to direct us, to speak to us, to guide us as we step into this new territory. And that more than anything, Lord, that we will know your voice and your presence in our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you turn to somebody and tell them, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Amen. Happy New Year. Amen. Wonderful. Happy New Year. Sure. Man. Did, didn't the worship team sound so good today? Come on, would you give them all a big hand? Amen. Amen. And, and I, and I, I don't want to embarrass you by keep saying something, but I'm so grateful that Elisa has stepped up and stepped in this, this last couple of Sundays. What a blessing she is. And I want you to know there's room for more. There is room for more. So we can use more musicians. We definitely need a male voice or two. 
We could use that. Um, so if God has put on your heart to play or to sing, you know, church is a wonderful place to learn, you know, because we're family. You know, exactly. We're not going to kick you out. We're not going to fire you. We're not going to reduce your pay, give you less hours, you know. <laughs> We're just going to love you. So um, I know that there's some people working on guitars that might have hurt her finger yesterday, but she's no excuse. She's still going to learn the guitar. Um, and I know that there's a banjo somewhere in the in the mix, wherever Josh is, it's working on that. And there's others. So if God has put on your heart to play or to sing, please let us know. Let Sonia you know. But just so grateful for our team. Amen? Amen. So a couple of quick announcements, and then we have a special uh, ceremony we're going to do in just a few minutes. Um, some things will be on the screen. A lot of the announcements are new uh, because this is the new year. By the way, I haven't seen you all since last year. I don't know where you've been. I'm glad you made it finally for a service in 2022. Just kidding. Uh, uh, um, it is great to see you all. It is great to be in the house of God in 2022. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So all these announcements are new. Um, so um, we'll come back to that one. But um, yeah, so um, men's, men's wings and pizza night this Wednesday night at Pizza Hut. These are all on the app, by the way. And if you don't have our app, please make sure you get that. It's a good start to this year. Download the church app. There's papers in the back that will help you link to that real easy. Um, and make sure you connect to the group chat because that's our main way of communicating between services. So make sure you do that. So all these are on our church app now. The men's wings and pizza night. We have um, we have a Valentine's banquet already scheduled and rolling. Uh, Leslie is working on that. We're so grateful for Leslie and for John with the whole family, and uh, that's exciting. So that'll be Saturday, September the 12th at 5 p.m. at the church. There'll be more information to come about that, but just mark that on your calendar, um, and uh, that's going to be a great, great night. Um, also, uh, this Tuesday night we're back doing red. Regular Tuesday night service. For those that can come early, if you can get here by 6, we're going to take down Christmas um, this Tuesday night at 6 o'clock. So if you can come early and help with that, that will be wonderful. Um, and we'll take everything down. I like to leave it up as long as we can, but going into the next week, I guess we got to move on, right? So um, we'll do that early on Tuesday night. Uh, a big thing that's coming up, and I want to just take a minute and talk about this. Starting this coming Sunday is our 21 days of prayer and fasting. We've done this every year as long as I've ever been at the church, but I've done it long before I ever came to this church. So I don't know how many years I've done this, probably 30 years, I don't know, um, maybe longer. Um, and, and for me, January has become such an important time. It, a lot of things are not going on. It, it's quieter. It's colder. Uh, you can't do as much yard work. It's a great time. All the major festivities are over. It's a great time to stop, slow down, and listen to the voice of God. It's a good time to reset as you go into a new year as well and get that, that regular devotional back on track that most of us kind of slipped up on as we went through last year, to, to get back your regular prayer time. Uh, and so the, 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 the commitment to prayer and fasting, and we'll start it next, this, a week from today. So it gives you a week to eat all that leftover Christmas stuff and all that candy you want to gorge on uh, for the next few days. And, and then get into a week from now beginning the fast. I'll just mention there are several fasts in the Bible, and I'm not going to read the references. They're up here. I can give them to you if you're interested. There's an Esther fast that was three days with no food and no water. There's a self-examination fast in the book of Leviticus, which was one day every year, certain day. There was a fast before a battle. That's referenced in Judges chapter 20. If you're about to go into a battle, I recommend some prayer and fasting in your life. We may be going into a battle this year. That's enough reason already. Amen? to fast and pray. Dominion fast is the ultimate fast, by the way. That's the 40-day fast that Jesus did with no food. I, I, I've experienced that involuntarily. <laughs> I think I went 42 or 43 days with just liquids last year. Um, so I don't intend to do that at one again. Um, <laughs> it's a good way to lose 45 pounds. <laughs> is do just liquids for 40 plus days. Don't recommend that one to you, but if you really want to, my mom has done that voluntarily. 
And I'm impressed with anyone that does, but it's a big deal. The Daniel fast is one that is listed in Daniel chapter 1 and in Daniel 10. And those are either a 10-day fast or a 21-day fast. He did both. And they're basically just vegetables, water and vegetables. Um, and so I encourage you to look at what type of fast you're going to do. But commit to pray and commit to fast. And, and something that wasn't in the Bible, go ahead and sit down, baby wasn't in the Bible, um, is a media fast because there was no internet. There was no all these devices. And I really believe that's an important part of our fast, is for 21 days cutting out some kind of media. That may mean for you television. It might mean social media. It might mean game systems. Whatever that may be that takes up a lot of your time. Commit to that for 21 days. It's amazing how much time you'll free up to pray when you're not looking at some device. Amen? Yeah. It's amazing how that'll do, that'll do for you. Um, so I encourage you to look at fasting prayer, fasting, no, sorry, fasting food and praying, and fasting media. And whatever you do, when you fast food, don't be wimpy. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to fast Pepsi for 21 days. Hey, I did a big deal. Or I'm going to fast broccoli for 21 days. Yeah, I'm really sacrificing. <laughs> I want to fast something else that I don't like for 21 days. No, do something that inconveniences you. Do something that interrupts your life and makes you have to think about, oh, I'm not doing that for 21 days, and makes you have to do something different in your life. And let that be a reminder to you at those moments at least three times a day, or how many times you eat. You might eat six times a day. How many times you eat, a reminder to you to stop and pray. Amen? So here's some things that, that I always do every year, and, and we kind of change it up a little bit, but I cut out fast food every year. I cut out desserts and sweets across the board. None of that. We're also going to cut out pork this year. So I cannot get a Powell's Burger with cheese and bacon for 21 days after this coming Sunday. I will hit pals this week, I promise. <laughs> but those are some things that inconvenience life for me. And, and for us, we have to think about what we do because we always eat an evening meal together. So whatever I do affects everybody else. So that's a discussion Cherish and I have together and do something we can all coordinate and do. But make sure it inconveniences you in some way that you're reminded to pray every single day. Amen? Something else that I do, this is, this is something very easy to do as far as coordinating, is part of your fast, do a total fast. Often I'll start the fast out with one day, two, three days of just water. And I'll end my fast that way. That's really easy to coordinate. You don't have to think about what you're going to fix different. You just don't eat. <laughs> I don't recommend more than three days of that. But to do a total fast for 24 hours, it's amazing what that will do to drive you to really pay attention to God. Well, something it does spiritually when you fast, it, it really does connect you to God because you're denying something your flesh wants in order to pursue Him. And there's something beautiful about that. I will share with you next week some things that you can be praying about as a church that will come next week in my message next Sunday. But I want to just read a verse. And this is the purpose of fasting. Isaiah 58, starting in verse 6. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked that you cover him, and do not hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. That's Isaiah 58, 6 through 9. The fast that God has chosen is a fast that brings freedom and causes you to hear his voice. So be praying about that. you got a week to figure it out. Amen? And we'll do that together.
Amen. One more thing to announce, and then I'll, um, I'll, we're going to do a special ceremony uh, with the Burke family in just a moment. Um, we've been having some issues with our internet glitching with those watching at home, and we really want those at home to be able to see the service well. We don't know exactly what it is, um, but if you are connected to the church Wi-Fi, if you wouldn't mind to disconnect during service, and then also while you're doing it, go ahead and mute your phone. That's a good thing to do. Um, and um, so the service is quiet for everything that's supposed to be quiet. But maybe that'll help the, 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 the live feed at home. All right. Secret sister forms do next Sunday. I need a secret sister. They get good stuff. Uh, can I be included? I, no? Oh. Oh. <laughs> well. All right, so I want to ask, um, before we do the offering and dismiss the kids, if uh, David and Raquel and Edward, is that the right way to say it? Is that correct, Edward? Edward, Edward okay. Edward and Laura Salcedo, and also Isabel, if you would come up to the front here, amen. And I want to ask you all to stand facing everybody, if you would, just stand facing everybody. Okay. All right. Amen. Oh, really? I don't think you realize. Okay. <laughs> this is us three. All right. So how you doing? It's good. Good. <laughs> Haven't seen you since last year. Where you been? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad you're laughing at that. I want everybody to laugh. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> just so those that are home can hear good I want to let David just kind of hold that okay. and it'll sort of pick up your voices you don't have to put it up to your mouth but right. just so it'll kind of yeah okay. that'd, be, that'd be great or we could put it on the stand if that's awkward whatever no, you want okay, okay. All right, so the, today we're doing something very special. Um, in fact, y'all come this way just a little bit. That'll help the camera too. Sorry, we're, enter, we're, we're watching. Those at home can watch, okay. So this is very special. So we are doing a kind of a combination of a dedication of Isabel. This is all about Isabel, by the way, right now. So come stand up, stand, stand in front here. Oh, okay. And also the official uh, installing of Godparents for Isabel. So uh, this is beautiful. So we're going to kind of do this like a regular dedication. And let me just say, if you have not had a dedication for your children, it doesn't matter how old they are. If you'd like to do this, this is a beautiful way to just really commit to the church, to raise them to honor the Lord. So if you haven't done that, we've done it babies and on up to, you know, 12, 13 year old kids. So whatever age you want to do it, it's just fine. How old are you? Um, 11. 11. So you're not even 12 or 13, so you're good. All right, so, um, and by the way, this is a date to remember. This is 1 2 2 2, January the 2nd, 2022. So that's pretty cool. Almost all twos. So, Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. People were bringing little children to Jesus to have him touch them. But the disciples rebu rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I will tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, put his hands on them, and blessed them. And actually when they're babies, I love to do this, when we do this just to hold that little baby. I'm not going to be able to do that with Isabel this morning. That's a, I could try. <laughs> She's pretty light. I could probably manage to pick her up. So the dedication of Isabel Grace Berg is a beautiful and solemn occasion. Here's, I looked up what Isabel means, and there's always more than one definition, but this seemed to be a popular definition. Pledged to God. That's a beautiful definition. It also means... have the same meaning. Really? Wow, how cool is that? <laughs> probably comes from Elizabeth, probably, yeah. But um, pledged to God, or God is my oath. That's a pretty cool definition, isn't it? Yeah. Grace, her middle name, I love that. That's Eliana's middle name as well. The, the, the biblical word for that or explanation of that is God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. 
but it also, it also it originates in the word goodness and generosity. That's exactly you. <laughs> yeah. She's all that. She's all that. <laughs> Pledged to God, goodness, generosity. I also looked up the meaning of the word berg. You probably know this. But if you look at the German and Dutch background, there's different backgrounds. The German and Dutch, it's a topographical name. It means someone who lived by a hill or a mountain. <laughs> what about that? <laughs> that kind of fits as well. <laughs> so I love the meaning of words. And if you look at uh, names and you look in the Bible, there's so many wonderful definitions of meanings of names. So it's beautiful. The dedication of this returning of Isabel Graceberg to the Lord, who was given her life. 1 Samuel 1, 27-28, For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore I have also lent him, or her, to the Lord. As long as he or she lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. This is also a charge to David and Raquel, and as her parents, and Edward and Laura uh, Salcedo as godparents, um, to raise her in the fear of the Lord and to teach her to love the Lord. This is a wonderful, wonderful responsibility. Dedication does not automatically make any child a Christian. This is simply our desire to return them to God and to thank God for them and commit to raise them to serve God. Every child has to make that decision for themselves as to serve the Lord. And I believe Isabel's already been baptized, right? Yeah. So you've already made that decision, which is wonderful. And our job is to help encourage you to keep down that path so that you may continue to make that decision to honor God. So I have some wording to read. This is a little bit like a marriage ceremony. So um, I'll get the several versions I read, and after I, get, I'll say, after I get through it, I'll say, do you accept this charge? And you'll just say, I do. Uh, and then there'll be the same thing for the church. Esther, you got to go sit down, baby. She's trying to lift my leg up as she hugs me. All right. David and Raquel as parents of Isabel Grace and Edward and Laura as godparents. I charge you this day before God and before all of these present to live an example of a truly godly life before her, doing only those things that are pure and right before God to teach her to love the Lord Jesus Christ, to bring her to church so that she may receive additional instruction and enjoy God's presence, to pray for her and with her that she may, as she already has, receive Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior while she's still young. This is your responsibility. Do you accept this charge? I do. I do. I do. Amen. Praise God. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. So I want to pray for you. I want to pray for the parents and the godparents. And then we'll turn to the congregation. So Lord, we just pray for Edward and Laura, for, for David and Raquel, parents and godparents of this beautiful young lady, Isabel. We pray that you will strengthen them. And even that they have made the commitment to live for you, to show Christ to Isabel in the way that they live, to pray with her, to, to bring her to church, to guide her in, 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 the, in, the, in the path of following you. I pray that you will strengthen them. I pray you'll give them wisdom. I pray that you'll give them understanding. I, I pray, Lord, that you'll give them perception in areas. And, and when things need to be addressed with Isabel, they'll do it with grace and with insight and with love and with understanding, but also with strength and with confidence. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you will continue to reveal yourself to them as parents and as godparents. That they will know you in an ever-increasing way. They won't ever become stagnant in their walk with you. But I pray, O oh God, that they will continue, Lord, to grow in their walk with you. And their understanding of your word. That they may show that understanding and that revelation to Isabel. We just pray your blessing upon them. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 I mean, to hit your head as it went over you. Amen. Amen. So now, if the congregation will stand, there is a charge to you all as well. And I want to ask you to say, I do, or we do. In fact, you'll say, with God's help, we will, is what you'll say. So here is the congregation's charge. It is our responsibility as the family of God that we will provide a place of worship and instruction for Isabel. 
and indeed for all of our children, where she will hear the Word of God. I ask that you will set an example, every one of you, by your lives and maintain an atmosphere here that will inspire her to always desire to follow Jesus. I ask you to continue to pray that God leads her closer to Him. If you're willing to do that, say, with God's help, we will. With God's help, we will. All right, so now I want to pray for Isabel. Come here, I'm not going to pick you up like a little baby. <laughs> Would you just stretch your hands towards this young lady? Well, we just thank you for Isabel. Lord, she is, as her name says, a, a one that is good and is gracious. We thank you that she is a life pledged to God. And we thank you that she lives near a hill, just like her last name, <laughs> or mountain. But we pray your blessing upon her. We thank you for her. We pray that you will, even from the day forward, that she will know a closer walk with you, that you will reveal your word to her, you will, you will reveal your presence to her. Let her know, learn and know your voice and be able to distinguish your voice from all the other voices in her life and know when it's you speaking to her. Lord, your word says that your sheep know your voice and a stranger's voice they will not follow. We pray that over Isabel. We thank you for it. We pray you'll keep her strong and healthy and I pray, oh God, that you will make her a witness to those that she comes in contact with. Guide her strengthen her throughout all of our life, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Would you give God a big hand of praise? Amen. Amen. Bless you. Bless you. Amen. Bless you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for Love you. This You're welcome. Love you all. Bless you. Amen. You can sit down if you want to. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Andy, take amen. it away. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to real quick. <laughs> Amen. Everybody doing all right today? Isn't it great to be in the house of God? God is so good. All right, kids, I need you all to listen to me real quick. After Miss Leslie sings you're going to be dismissed. So y'all need to pay attention to Miss Leslie. She's going to be y'all's teacher today, and you've got to wait until she sings before you're dismissed, okay? All right, real quickly. We've been moving, so my life is a little disorganized at the moment. I need everybody that has a birthday this week to stand up. Absolutely nobody. Oh, wait a second. Ivy's got a birthday this week? Had it Sunday. Okay. We can sing to Miss Ivy. We didn't sing to her last week, I don't think. All right, so we're going to sing happy birthday to Miss Ivy, okay? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Ivy. Happy birthday to you. Amen. How old is she, Leslie? She's four? Awesome. We've got a really, really huge group of kids in this place, don't we? <laughs> I'm going to quickly move on. This year, guess what? You have a whole new year to give. If, you, if your giving was down last year, pick it back up this year. There's a lot of things happening in the community. There's a lot of things happening in this church. How many different ways are there to give here at church? In the basket and online on the app. That's the way I give. The app has come in extremely handy for me. So as you give this morning, I want y'all to, you know, kind of reflect back on what you did last year. And I want to challenge you this year, really seriously challenge y'all to step it up this year. I promise you God will make a way in your life when it comes to money. In other areas too, we bought a house this year. 
The other Hales bought a house this year. The Smiths bought a house this year. Chris bought a house this year. Last year. Oh, yeah, sorry. Y'all know what I meant. <laughs> the Colsons bought a house. And I think Clay and them bought a bunch of houses. <laughs> So I promise you and challenge you to give. If you give, you can't outgive God. And He'll make that little piece of pie bigger for you. Here it is. In your bulletin, there are prayer request slips. Every week, we put our prayer request in this box and we spend time praying over it every single week. So I want to encourage y'all that it's okay to put your prayer request on paper. They are prayed for. They're not just stuck in a box and overlooked. You know, your needs are important to God and they're important to us. So as you give this morning, you can go ahead and put your prayer request in the basket as well. We'll pray over those. So Lord, I just thank you right now. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you're in charge. Lord, you know the situations in our lives. And Lord, as we give, Lord, I ask you to give back, Lord, so we can give more. Lord, and we, we reach out to you for our family members that are lost. Lord, we reach out to you for healing in our bodies. And Lord, we just thank you. We glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, before that, um, Valentine's Day dinner is going to be February the 12th at 5 p.m. here at the church, and we're trying to do a catered dinner, which is makes it be like $20 a person. And you'll have um, steak or chicken, whichever one you choose. Uh, Pamela's going to make some cards to give out. If you know when you um, pay, you can fill out the card of what you want to eat. It's going to be steak or chicken salad, baked potato, bread, and dessert. And we're going to have just fellowship and games along with the, the catered dinner. So anybody who is interested, let me, or I guess Pamela, is it okay for them to let you know since you're going to make cards to hand out? Or so, and we'll, if you have any questions, you can just ask and, and that's what we're going to do. Sleep. There's food on my table. 
I have one announcement. It says, I put a table in front of the nursery with clothes on it and have been left here for a while. Please go through and get what is yours. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. Okay, so. <laughs> All right. So if you would turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 10, and you guys get to hear me today. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't get to hear the curly haired preacher. Used to be, he went from just preacher to bald preacher to now he's got the, some odd curly hair in the back. It's, it's crazy. Yep. I don't know. <laughs> what is going to be next? <laughs> we were saying the word Jerry Curl. If anybody remembers what Jerry Curl is. But I, I hope everybody's had a good start to the new year. And uh, we had a new year service here. Uh, what was it? Friday. It was New Year's Eve. So we had a new year service, New Year's Eve. And, and it was great. And one thing that uh, I felt when I was there was it was like through this past year uh, as I was looking around I was just seeing brothers yeah. you know seeing so many brothers it's like I have a brother uh, sitting right back there and we share the same mother you know but it, it was neat but I was seeing like I was looking I was seeing men and this this bond that I have with them and just this this inside of me where if somebody was to mess with one of them that just I was going to be there for them you know like true brothers and 
it's just great what the Lord has done for us. Give us this church family. Um, so, before we get started, I'm going to tell a joke. Now, I'm, I'm not good at telling jokes, but I heard this one, I thought I'd tell it. Uh, so, it's a little Johnny joke. Has anybody ever heard little Johnny jokes? Yeah. Little Johnny? Nobody? Some of them are dirty, but not this one. Not really. I edited it. Now, uh, little Johnny was in Sunday school class, and the teacher in Sunday school was kind of quizzing the kids, seeing what they knew about the Bible, about holidays, and just wanting them to, to understand what everything was about. So the teacher was going around, she asked one kid in the class, she was like, what's, uh, what is Thanksgiving? What, what's Thanksgiving about? And the little kid was like, well, uh, Thanksgiving's about when we get together with our families, we eat a lot of food, but we, you know, the most important part is that we're giving thanks to God for everything He's done for us. The teacher's like, that is great. She's beaming with pride. And then she asks another kid, she's like, what is Christmas about? She's like, Christmas is about the birth of Jesus and how, how God became a, a baby in the manger and and the teacher's proud. She's like, yeah, that's great. And she's like, little Johnny, what is Easter about? And little Johnny said, well, Easter, Easter is about how, is, is about Jesus rose from the grave. He came out of the grave, came up out of the grave. And as the teacher was uh, about to, to say, good job, Johnny. And Johnny says, he came up out of the grave. And if he sees his shadow, he has to go back down for six weeks. <laughs> it's just funny because there's so much, so much of what we know is what we know. And we think a lot of times that we know this book and we think we're right about a lot of things a lot of times. And then one day, you know, you kind of realize, oh, I was a little bit wrong about that one thing. But what's important is that we learn this book, yeah. right? That we reverence this book, that we yeah. break into God's Word and we treat it with the respect it deserves. And I was thinking as this year goes forward, one thing that we could uh, dedicate is like, well, I know we can make a lot of promises like losing weight or, or things that are harder to do. And like maybe, maybe you can't read this book in a year, you know, or set to one of those plans and stick to it, but one thing that we could do is just recommit ourselves to holding this book in reverence. Yes. Like when the scriptures are opened, that we just stand in reverence, that we, that we acknowledge that this is holy. Yes. And, you know, that we truly, if you really want to know God, yes, we pray and we fast and we seek to know Him, but if you really want to know Him, you, you get into this book and you treat it. You treat it like it is, right? Like, it, like it's the Word of God. This is the book God meant for us to have. And, and it's here. God used men to write this book, but He used them like an artist uses a paintbrush. You don't give credit to the paintbrush for the painting that you see. You give credit to the artist and God may have used men to write this, but he's the artist. Amen. He's the author of this book. Yes. All right. So if you could read with me in uh, Mark chapter 10, we're going to go verse 17, chapter 22. Or chapter 22, I'm sorry. Chapter 17, I mean chapter 10, verse 17. We're going to read 17 to 22. And hopefully... I get a little better with my words. All right, how about we do this? How about we stand, if you can stand? If God has given you strong legs this year, let's stand and hold God's word in reverence as we read it. Verse 17. Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. And you know the commandments. 
Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your mother and your father. And he answered and he said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful, amazing day you've given us, this amazing opportunity we have to, to come together as a family, to come together as one, to try to get to know you more. Lord, to worship you, to praise you, to honor you, Lord. God, I ask that as we uh, are gathered here, Lord, as we're studying, as we're, as we're digging in and reaching out to you, Lord, as we're inviting your presence in, God, I ask that you would fill this room with your Holy Spirit. Lord, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, as I teach this, that you would keep me humble. Lord, that I wouldn't be puffed up with any prideful ideas. God, that it would be you speaking through me. Lord, I ask you to hold me accountable for every word that comes out of my mouth. Lord, everything I say, Lord. Lord, we praise you. And we thank you for doing this. In Jesus', Jesus name, amen. amen. All right. So as we read, it kind of leaps right into an action moment. You know, Mark is a book of action. It's just a book. It's, it's, it's more of a book that men like to read to. Like it's just a book where you get to dig in. You get to fast forward to the, uh, to the gunfight. You understand? It's like you, you just jump right in. And, and in this verse, it just goes from one thing to another. And the first thing you see is that this man approaches Jesus, right? He just jumps right in. And in the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this story's covered in all three. And when you put them all three together, you realize that this man is, is uh, rich, he's young, and he's got authority. He's a ruler over something. And in, so if you're reading this story and you come across it and it's like rich young ruler and you're like, well, it just says he's rich. It doesn't say he's a ruler. Or it doesn't really mention his age. Or Just understand that when you put all three of them together, that's where you get those pieces. That's why it's important that we read all of, all of this. You know, It's fun to stick to one, but dig in, but it is important. So we see that this guy's rich and young and he's got some authority, some power. And one of the things that sticks out immediately is that his disciples didn't try to stop this guy. Right? He jumps right in. Disciples basically, I imagine that they're in, they could probably be in the middle of a conversation, right? Have you ever had the guy that just busts in the room, doesn't care that other people are talking, interrupts everybody with whatever he wants to talk about? You ever been around that guy? Yeah, it's okay, David. <laughs> but at work... At work, I, I, I deal with that a lot, you know. We'll be dealing with one problem, and somebody just busts in with their problem, and it's like they don't wait their turn. They don't say, excuse me. They just bust in, and it's like, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, okay, and you try to take that in. You try to hang on, but I imagine this is kind of what happened. They are walking around. They're talking. They're with Jesus. You know they're talking. You know you're asking questions when you're Jesus. And this guy busts in and, and just interrupts with his issue. And nobody tries to stop him. Nobody says, hold up, buddy. He doesn't have time for you. Or, or uh, Jesus is a little tired right now. And that doesn't really have significance unless you take it into context. And if you back up to verse 13, and you see what happened here, it says, Then they brought the little children to him, that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was gently displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, 
Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms and laid his hands on them and blessed them. So when you put it into context, you see that in one sense, the disciples see some people bringing their kids up to Jesus. Uh, and we know culturally this, they were most likely bringing like infants, like carrying them and asking Jesus to kind of bless them. Right? And, and you see these people, it doesn't say that they're of a peasant type class, but it's kind of understood. Um, so these people are bringing in their kids and the disciples are like standing guard. Hey, 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 don't bother him. But then they see this young guy, probably attractive, dressed in really nice clothes, under, has some power, some powerful young rich guy, and he's probably adorned in nice things. Yeah. He maybe he has some servants with him, and he sees them approach Jesus, and and they don't even think, they don't hesitate. Of course, come on, come right in. Maybe they offered him a good seat. As Christians, it's. It's easy to fall into that trap. But as, as followers of Jesus, we're following Him. We're, we're letting Him set that example. And this really doesn't have a whole lot to do with uh, what I want to get into in this text, but it, it, is a, it is a strange way to kick it off that you see a flaw with the disciples in their thinking. And it's nice to understand that the disciples are human. Sometimes we have this thought of them as being perfect. Or we'll point out like one little incident. But Jesus didn't just go hang out with sinners. Jesus was teaching. The disciples were sinners too. He was just teaching them as they went. They made mistakes. He corrected them as they went. And uh, it's just good that God gives you a chance to correct yourself in it. So with that he approached Jesus and he said... Uh, good master or, or good and then Jesus automatically corrects his terminology or or just says why do you call me good I guess it's just a question there's only one good and that's God and and it's like Jesus is seeing this rich powerful young man who's obviously seeking something he's approached Jesus and Jesus says why are you calling me good there's only one good but God. He's not saying, I'm not God. He's not saying, I'm not good. It's almost as if Jesus is filling him out and saying, do you, do you realize that I'm, do you understand that? Like, do you understand I'm God? Yeah. There's only one good. You're calling me good. And, uh, but then he says, what can I do? And that's, that's really where we're going to be at today. What can I do to inherit eternal life? And, it, and it's that question that I get asked a lot. And if you guys talk to people that are unbelievers a lot and you're asking them about heaven, especially what I found is amongst older people that have never come to faith and they grew up around Christianity, especially here uh, in this mountainous region that we got, and they come in and they're automatically thinking about being good enough or what they're supposed to do. Right? I've had so many people tell me, I can't do it. I would like to be a Christian, but I just can't do it. And this guy asks, what can I do? It's like a husband, he just loves his wife, and he's at work all day, and, and she's staying home with the kids, and he just loves her, and he's thinking all day, what can I do to show her that I love her? What can I do for her? And he's thinking, you know, she loves roses. She loves flowers. She just loves the smell of them, and I want to get some flowers for her. So he, he stops by and he goes through the store and he's just picking out the best flowers. He's not just grabbing what's there. He's trying to find the best, the best roses. And he gets them, he, he gets them together, he, he gets them all dressed up and he brings them home to his wife. He comes in the door with these beautiful flowers and he gives them to her just to show her how much he loves her. And she grabs them, she's like, oh, this is beautiful. She's smelling them, she's like, thank you so much. And then she looks at her husband and says, how much do I owe you for them? And see, when we're looking at salvation, it's a gift. 
And He's given it to us. He has wrapped up this beautiful gift and He's handing it to us. And then we look at Him and we say, well, what do we owe you for it? What can I do? What am I supposed to do? What can I do for this? It's just a gift. It's a gift from your Father who loves you. Yes. But it says, uh, I've heard it said that that God created human beings. And ever since, we've tried to turn ourselves into human doings. Yeah. A lot of times, just being a Christian is just being. Yeah. Understand it's not about doing anything. It's a gift. So, at the end of that text, you see that the guy left sad. And as we're digging into this, I just want you to understand, Jesus wasn't trying to make him sad. Jesus was trying to set him free. So, number one, we're going to say, I'm going to skip to the end. I'm not going to go straight down because there's a portion of this text that gets skipped over a lot. And uh, it gets read, but it seems to come in at the end, and it's the most important part to understand because it's like you look at it and you're like, oh, Jesus tra set a trap. Like, have you ever seen apologists, uh, people witnessing to atheists about their faith? And it's like they set an apologetic trap, like they ask the question, and then the person answers it, and they're like, ha-ha, I got you. And, and it's like, oh, I got you with this zinger. You walked right into my trap. Well, Jesus isn't setting a trap, but I've heard it taught like that so much that Jesus was setting a trap. He's telling this kid, well, you know what to do. You know what to do. Just don't sin. Just don't, just honor your mother and father. And then the, and then the man says... Well, I've done it all. And then Jesus, they, they're still like, well, Jesus pointing out his sin. This is what I've heard so many times. Jesus pointing out the man's sin tells him to give everything away because his God was money. And it was like Jesus was setting a trap for this guy that Jesus wasn't. And I don't like that fault because Jesus doesn't set traps. Amen. Jesus just speaks truth. So it says in Mark 10, 21, that Jesus looked at him and loved him. So number one is Jesus loved him. Jesus loved him. We can get so obsessed with what we are giving up that we miss what we are gaining. Yeah. You understand we have a fast that's coming up, a corporate fast. And when you talk to people about fasting and when I, when I think about fasting myself, all I can think about is what I'm giving up, right? Like, I don't know if I can do it. You know, it's like, oh, that one fast, you know, as, as Matthew went through the types of fasts you can do, it's like, well, I don't know if I can eat, you know, not eat meat. Or I don't know if I can just drink, I just don't know. And it's like our focus tends to go directly to what we're giving up immediately. Right, we think about fast just directly. Oh, I don't know, what can I, what, I don't know if I can do it. Instead, our focus needs to be on what we're gaining this fast isn't about what we're giving up. This fast is about God speaking to us, about uh, being one with our Father and, and clarity to hear Him. Yeah. And it tends to be that way in the Old Testament. Uh, let's see, I got the chapter wrote down. Genesis 19. You hear Lot's wife, right? You have this man Lot, and he's moved into an evil city with his family, and God's going to destroy it. But lucky for Lot... He has a, a relative named Abraham who is trying to get God to spare his, his nephew. And uh, so God sends this rescue mission down in the Old Testament. And, and he's like down into Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's going to yank his family out and rescue Lot and his family before he destroys the city. And right in the middle of that, they're like, don't look back. Let's get out of here. You're going to hear things. Things are going to happen. Don't look back. Right? You're going to hear it. You're going to be tempted to look back, but don't. But it says in the story, if you guys are familiar with it, that Lot's wife, right as they're leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, you, you kind of imagine it climbing up the hill, you know, running. And this dramatic scene is there, and you're just hearing everything crash behind them and burn and explosions. And she turns around, and she looks back. After, and it's like she's looking back 
and thinking about what she's losing. And it could have just been something as simple as she thought, oh, you know, that one picture or painting I had hanging on the wall, I forgot to grab it. You know, it, it might not have been, oh, I just love this city so much. It just may have been a simple little thought like that of, oh, I forgot that one item. And she turns around thinking about what she's given up instead of what she's gaining. She's gaining life. Yeah. And she gets destroyed. It says in the Bible that she was turned into a pillar of salt. Uh, it, it could mean different things when you go into there, but what you do know is she was completely destroyed. She lost her life because of that. Her, her daughters lost their mother. Husband lost his wife because she couldn't not look back. She couldn't stop focusing on what she was giving up. So number two, sadness. We read that this man left sad because Jesus told him to take everything he has, sell it, give it to the poor, and follow me. And it tends to be uh, taught, and as I was reading through this text and, and praying about it and reading what other commentators have said, it's often, it's like they just jump right to this guy being sad, and it's like you miss what's really happening here is Jesus is making an offer. Yeah. Jesus offered this man. He wasn't trying to punish this man. It wasn't like he was putting him in a, uh, in a word trap. All you think you're good, go sell all your stuff. Let's show you how bad you are. Jesus wasn't doing that. Jesus was honest and truthful, and we have to read that in context. Jesus was just telling the man, go sell everything you got and come follow me. Yeah. Read it with, without all this contextual lenses in front of your eyes. See the text for what it says. Jesus just offered this man eternal life. He wanted, to, he wanted eternal life. Jesus loved him and he said, go sell everything you got and come on, let's go. So a lot of Christian sadness comes from trying to follow Jesus while carrying luggage. You see, we may not have a lot of possessions, right? And we kind of look at this man and we're like, yeah, we can safely judge this guy because I'm not wealthy, right? Or I'm not young anymore. I don't have power. I can judge this guy and look like I'm better than him. But if you live in America, you're wealthy. I don't know if you understand if you live in America, you can't starve to death. You starve to death, it's on purpose. You have a mental illness or something. It, it's not going to happen naturally in this country. You're not going to miss a meal. You're going to have three meals a day. I mean, like I've said before, if you go to L.A. right now, you can see homeless people that are that weigh more than I do because they're well-fed, even, even people living on the streets. Uh, our number one uh, New Year's resolution is to lose weight in this country. It's not to, please, Lord, allow me to eat enough. It's, I want to lose weight, <laughs> you know, because I have so much to eat. And we, we tend to hang on to luggage that's like bitterness, unforgiveness, right? We try to follow God. Jesus says, just get rid of all that stuff and just follow me. And that's all you got to do. You yeah. don't have to climb a mountain. You don't have to do anything difficult. Just drop the stuff and follow me. And it's so strange because we just can't. We re we'll even agree to it. We're like, yes, I'm going to follow you. And then we grab a handful of something and we just start dragging it on the ground. But eventually we reach a point where it's either let go, let go and keep following, or hang on to it because you've hit a snag and you just, and it's so strange. It's like the saying, the, the story that they tell about the monkeys reaching their hands in the jar and how they trap them. And they'll, they'll put a, a jar with a hole in the top of it. And it's like, 
just big enough to get the hand in, but once you grip it and make the fist, you can't get it out, and the monkeys won't let go of, of the thing that they've grabbed, so they can't get their hands out of this big jar. All they'd have to do is let go and they escape, but they won't let go of it, so then they get caught. And, and it's so similar. So, well, if you guys will bear with me, we'll go to Matthew 6.24. Matthew 6, 24. You find it. It says in Matthew 6, 24, and Jesus speaking again, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Which means money. So a lot of times we're following Jesus and we're we're saying we're followers of Jesus, but we're really, we're followers of Jesus and. And there can't be an and. You follow Jesus. And it's like, well, we look at the rich man, we're like, yeah, he should lay down his treasures. He should just give it all to the poor if he really loves Jesus. But it's like, what is your possession? What is my possession? Is it my political affiliation? Jesus said, you got to lay all this down and follow me. That's the offer, right? You walk, you go to the altar and you're like, Jesus, I just want to follow you. What can I do? And he's just like, loves you. Sees you there and he loves you. And he just says, just drop all this stuff and follow me. Or if it's, it can be anything. It's so easy to judge. It's so easy to look at a wealthy person and judge them. I remember growing up as a teenager, I uh, listened to all this punk rock music and stuff, and they wasn't so open about things back then, but it was very socialist, right? And I didn't realize what it was, is anarchy and socialism, and, and it was like, hate the rich, even though the people singing, most of them are rich. It was like, hate the rich. So I grew up, I didn't know why I did, but I resented rich people, right? I didn't understand life, really. And I remember going home from work one time. I was in North Carolina. I was all on my own. I was, I was 18 years old, and I'd left home and had nobody to depend on. And I'm trying to get home from work, and, and I'm driving through Winston-Salem. And there's this part where there's a lot of traffic at that time of the morning. Like, everybody's going to work and going home from work. And, and I was on night shift. And it's, it's like my car just dies right there on the street. And there's curbs this high on both sides. There's no place, you can't push the car off the road because there's curbs. And there's a long ways to go. And, I, and I'm like, oh, what do I do? And I get out of the car and I start to try to, like, I guess I'm going to have to push this thing. And right when I do, all these working class people like myself that were in cars, you know, that looked like my car, instead of getting out and helping me, they start beeping at me. Like they, like they see I'm trying to push this car and they're beeping because I guess I'm not pushing it fast enough and just beep beep and and if that wasn't good enough it starts raining immediately it's just like boom rain so I'm trying to push and and then I I remember I'm pushing and I slip and my knee just hits the pavement hard boom and I was like I'm in pain now and I'm trying to limp and push this thing and they're beeping at me and it was crazy because this guy in this like Ferrari pulls up and he has his what I think is like the, the trophy wife. And he's obviously very wealthy. And he gets out of his car while all, all, all my people, you know, that I consider it my people, they were just beeping at me to get out of the way. This, this wealthy guy gets out of his car in his nice suit and shoes, slick shoes. And he helps me push my car like, it, was, it felt like 100 feet till we got down to a spot where we could do it. And in a time when most people didn't have cell phones, this guy obviously had one. And he's like, hey, I have a cell phone. Do you need to call anybody? I'll wait here with you, all this. And it was like, I didn't even know God at that time, but I could feel that I was being taught a lesson yeah. about hate, about judgment, about trying to, to see these things. But it, it's like we try to, we, we look around and we're like, man, all these sad Christians and it's like we're trying to hold on to something yeah. that God has told us to let go of. Yeah. It's like a dog 
in a cage, right? You see uh, dogs get put in kennels a lot. Have you ever seen a dog in a kennel? You know, and sometimes it's a small little cage, and you see the dog like scratching at fleas, and it just seems like they just won't quit. It's just scratch, 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 right? But if you take that same dog, and you like set, uh, you take it outside in a field full of rabbits, and you open that door, what do you think that dog's going to do? It's going to start chasing those rabbits, right? It's going to be on the chase, right? One minute ago, it couldn't think of nothing but scratching fleas. Those fleas were driving it crazy. It's, but you put it in front of a rabbit, you put a rabbit in front of it, you start chasing, that dog can't think of nothing but chasing that rabbit. It still has those fleas biting it, but it doesn't even notice the fleas biting it anymore because it's, it's in the chase. You see, as we're following Jesus, uh, we have a mission. Yes. And we're in the chase, and, and we have things that can bother us, right? We look around the world, and we see injustice. We see things to be sad about, right? We see loved ones in pain. We're in pain. But when you enter into that chase with Jesus, and you, you start doing the things Jesus is telling us to do, that's when you stop noticing a lot of this pain, right? And you say, well, there's injustice, there's the stuff, but it's like, there's a rabbit in front of me, I'm going to chase it. Yeah. So number three, let's talk about grace. And uh, it is a, grace is, is a topic that shouldn't be difficult to teach. But in our current culture, in the culture we live in, especially Christian culture, some reason it's a, grace. Grace is very misunderstood. Um, you know, you have conversations with people, and it's like they don't understand what being a Christian is. It's like they're more they're afraid of they're like doing Christianity. So it's like. Well, this person ain't no... They start pointing out Christians. This person's worse than me. You know? Well, all them people in church, they're worse than me. And it's like... They don't understand grace. But why not? Why, why is grace misunderstood? I don't, I don't think it really gets taught. A whole lot. In churches today, it gets talked about. I don't think it really gets explained... So being good is not about inheriting eternal life. Right? Being good is not about inheriting eternal life. So when, when a man says, how can I be a Christian? Being good isn't the answer that you should give him. Right? I had this conversation with a young man and he was raised around church. He knew, like, as a child. And the message he kept hearing was, I got to be good. I got to be a good boy. Uh, when witnessing to uh, homosexuality, right? And, and I'm talking to a person who is gay. I don't say, well, you got to quit being gay. Right? That's not the gospel. What is the gospel? And it's like, well, that's dangerous. You should tell them they got to quit being gay. I was like, no, I'm going to tell them that Jesus loves them. I'm going to tell them that Jesus died for them and that he rose from the dead and that if you put all your faith and trust and belief in that, that you will have eternal life. And that's what the Bible says. Now, now you start telling people things like that and it's like, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. If you tell people they can just do anything, then why should they not sin? Why should they not be a homosexual? Why should they not commit adultery? Why should they not uh, lie, cheat, and steal? And Jesus, Jesus came up with a really, a really simplified answer when it came to the commandments because that's what he was asked about constantly. What is, what's the best commandment? And Jesus said, 
to love your God with all your heart. And then he's like, but the second one is just as good. It's equal. And he says, to love your neighbor as yourself. So it's just love God, love people. Why do you not steal? Is it so that you'll go to heaven? Or is it because you love God and love your neighbor? All right, why are you not practicing sexual immorality? Is it because you want to go to heaven and you think that you're going to impress God with good deeds? Or is it because you love God and love your neighbor? I don't, I don't steal from my neighbor because I love him. You understand? Our motivation for not sinning is not so that we can go to heaven. It is through grace, through faith. That is our motivation for not sinning. So when you are in Christ, and you are following Christ, and you mess up, right? Nobody in this room has not messed up. There's nobody here that's perfect that's not messed up once. But you know you're still in Christ. And because of grace, you understand, yes, that was wrong. I should not have done this thing. But I am still a Christian. I am still a follower of Jesus. You correct course. You repent of sin. You say, I'm sorry, Lord. But you get up. And you have to understand that Jesus, that when, when you mess up, God isn't looking at you like, like he looks at you with disgust, like you're pathetic. Right? It's like the toddler that's learning how to walk. And... The toddler starts walking, and it takes one step, and then two steps, and the parents are like, come on, come on, come on, come on. Two steps, three steps, and then the toddler falls. Would the dad stand over the toddler pointing at him and yell at him and say, you pathetic little kid. You only did three steps. Or, and most of you guys know this, you pick the kid back up. You understand? You pick the kid back up and you say, you did three steps. You're so excited. The kid did three steps. And you say, let's go for four. Let's try to get all the way across the living room. And you cheer him on. And every, when the kid falls, you don't scream at it. And when you fall, your father isn't. You're, you're following Jesus and you trip and you fall. You mess up. You make a bad decision. Yeah, you're going to feel some pain because of that decision. But that doesn't mean that you're not in Christ, you repent, you move on because you love God and you love people. Do you understand? And, and it's so important that we understand how to view God. It's so important that we view our Father the right way. There's so many people that look at us and because they don't understand grace, they think, I would love to be a Christian. I just can't do it. It's like, it's not about doing it, buddy. It's about a father who loved you so much that he gave his only son who died on the cross for you. If you just believe. We look at Jesus and we say, just like this man, we go, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And the answer is, just believe. Right? We taught, uh, I think, chapter 9, and, and the man brings his son to Jesus. And he says, can you help him? And Jesus answers, can you believe? That's it. Just believe. So, uh, uh, if you'll humor me, I'll try another joke. Another Johnny joke. So you got this small plane and you have uh, some passengers and on the plane you have Johnny and then you have uh, uh, a priest and then you have a businessman and then you have the pilot, of course, flying the plane. Well, the pilot comes out and starts, tells the guys, he's like, I'm sorry, something's happened. We have a fuel leak. This plane is going down. And then he's like, 
He says, there is uh, four of us. There's three parachutes. I'm the pilot. I'm taking one. See you later. You guys work it out. And the pilot grabs that parachute, puts it on, jumps out of the plane. All right, so at that point, you have little Johnny, the businessman, and the priest. Well, then the businessman's like, guys, you guys don't understand how important I am. He's like, if the world, the world needs me. I am important. There's a, I have a lot of employees. I'm sorry, but I'm grabbing this parachute. You, I'm sorry, guys. He grabs the parachute, jumps out of the plane really fast. And, and, and then there's one parachute left. And uh, Johnny and the priest are there. And the priest looks at Johnny, little Johnny. And he's like, well, Johnny, he's like, I'm, I've lived a good life. You're a young boy. I want you to have this last parachute. I'll go down with the plane. Don't worry. God loves me. I'm good. I know, I know God. I'm good. And little Johnny looks at him and says, well, it's okay. He said, that really important businessman just jumped out of the plane with my backpack on. He's like, there's, there's actually one for both of us now, so we're good. That's kind of the way it is. And I, I use this parachute analogy is that when you jump out of a plane, right, if you were to jump out of the plane, say you're that businessman, and he starts flapping his arms, it doesn't matter how hard he flaps, right? He's not going to fly, is he? It doesn't matter. He's, he could have, like, really big arms, bigger than mine, and, and just work out every day. He could flap as hard as he wants. He's not going to save himself, right? But if he had the parachute on, right? He puts the parachute on. That parachute is saving him. What we tend to do, though, is we put that parachute on. We're given the parachute. We start floating down to the ground, and we are saved. And as we're doing it, we're flapping our arms, thinking that we're helping the parachute. Right? And we, we convince ourselves, I'm helping the parachute. It's a good thing I'm doing this. It's, but it's, it's ridiculous, right? It looks ridiculous. You see a man floating to the ground with a parachute, and he's doing this, thinking... It makes no sense. But that's the way that we tend to approach our faith. And it's like, no, flapping your arms isn't helping. It isn't saving you. But we do have a mission to save others. So while we're busy trying to flap our arms and, and earn our way and do things to impress God, we're, there's these, these people that are suffering, people that need to know Him. Correct? People need to know Jesus and we got to let go everything. So the musicians want to come up and uh, I'll close out. I just want to say that like Matthew said at the New Year's service, a lot of times this New Year is like a uh, fresh start. You know, it's really just another day. It's just a day. But it's a fresh start for a lot of people. And it can be a fresh start for us. So as we start this year, and we go into our fast, let's let go of things. Amen. Don't let anything hold you back. Whatever you're gripping in your hands, just drop it and follow Jesus. And if you're struggling with like not feeling like you're worthy, you're not worthy. You're not worthy of, of the gift God give us. That's the thing. Is, it's the greatest gift that's ever given, but you got to be okay with that. Just, just accept Him. Don't let anything hold you back. Let's say it. Let's pray, guys. Lord, we thank You for Your amazing gift that You've given us, Lord. Father, we thank You for... Uh, for being here with us tonight, I mean today. Lord, I thank you for using somebody like me, Lord. God, uh, if, if I can get up and teach your word, anybody can. Lord, we just ask that you help us this year, Lord, to see the things that we need to be doing, uh, the mission, Lord. God, help us to stay on mission this year. Lord, give us a clear vision. 
Lord, help us to see the next step. Lord, we just thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, as they're praying, I want to remind everybody that this altar is open. And if there's anything you need to lay down this year, just come to this altar and leave it at this altar. And, and let's truly follow Jesus and just be Christians. Thank you.
right. Amen. We do have a, a wonderful, we have a great God. And I think all too many times, I, I think we forget our place. And I thank you, Kevin, for bringing that message. Because I know I need to be reminded. You know, it's not about me. It's not about what I can do. When it comes down to it, every single thing that I do is worthless, in all honesty. If it's not done through God, if it's not done for God, it's worthless. And so I definitely would encourage you, I know, especially as we go into this time of prayer and fasting, you know, it's going to be a, a refocus for me. And so I encourage you guys as well. As we go into this time, let's refocus. Let's put God where he needs to be. Yeah. In the forefront of our lives. Let's make sure that we're not doing some fruitless effort. But what we're doing is, is honoring to God. So if you would, just bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Father, we thank you for this message, Lord, this reminder, Father God. Lord, as we go into this new year, Father, we just ask that, Lord, you just be with us. Help us, Lord, to refocus our minds. Help us, Lord, to remember who you are, what you do. Father, help us, Lord, to just be able to have the right actions for the right reasons. Help us, Lord, to reach those that are unsaved. And help us to reach them, Lord, not with a message that you have to do something, but that you have to just receive. You have to have the faith. You have to believe. And, Father, you'll take it from there. So, Father, we just ask, help us, Lord. Help us to be the servants to you that we should be. Guide us, Lord, in our paths. And just open the doors, Father, so that we might reach our community, our country, Lord, our world for you. So, Father, help us now. We thank you. We praise you, Father. First in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right. You guys are released. We thank you. We love you. All right. Tuesday night, if you can, be here at 6 to help with the decorations. We have the service. Otherwise, love you. Mean it.